I think the most impressive feature of the New York City subway is the fact that it has four track main lines with local and express service in both directions. If you're not familiar with the, with the subway, you can see what I'm talking about on this track chart, which is just a diagram to show where the tracks are. Each line is a track, not a rail. So for instance, on the seven line here in purple, you've got two tracks, one in each direction. But this on this map of Midtown, you can see that most of the, of the main lines have four tracks two tracks in each direction and the inner tracks are the express trains and the outer tracks are the local trains. Here's a diagram where you can maybe see this cutaway to kind of see how it works. The express trains go down the center, they'll stop at certain stations and then you can just walk across the platform to get to a local train. It's all the same fare. So it's, it works as one system. And I think it is unique among subways or metro systems in the extent of the four track system with this integrated local and express service. Certainly, you know, many countries, they have mainline railways with four tracks and you have express trains that usually go down, they may go down the center, but it's not necessarily coordinated as a single service. And for a, for a rapid transit, for, for travel within a city, this four track setup is pretty unique to be, again, to be so extensive. Other cities have little sections of it here and there, but nothing like New York, but it was also Despite being suppressive, it's very difficult to, to pin it down. Why did they do it? And it seems like everyone just had agreed that it would be when they were designing it. So I really wanted to figure out why does it have it in their report in 1891, when they really put this, the design together that the most of today's New York City subway has, they describe it this way. They say that the system should provide for express trains at high speed for long distances and for way service, local trains, for intermediate distances upon separate tracks, so located as to facilitate at proper intervals and exchange from express to local and from local to express trains. But they don't say why. They don't explain why, but we're gonna find out. Because I found out, I'm gonna tell you guys, and it's really interesting. So welcome to Making Infrastructure Pay. I'm Kyle Kirschling. I'm a CPA, I'm a city planner, I spent more than 10 years working for the New York City subway, and now I'm a transportation consultant. And I want to, my goal is to kind of help people understand the value of infrastructure, because I think it's, I love infrastructure, especially urban infrastructure, and I want it to be better. So I want to show the value it has and how it could be much more valuable, you know, how to make it pay. And as a disclaimer, these views are my own. They are not necessarily those of I'm a consultant, nor the New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority, since I don't even work there anymore. Anyway, so what do I mean when I say why, why four tracks, why the local express system? So to be clear, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about the thinking of the designers or the decision makers of the people who decided, who came up with this design and made the decision that it would look the way it does today. And that design really came together in 1891, took almost a decade before they were able to start construction on it. But most of today's, most of today's New York City suburb reflects this 1891 design. And this video is actually part of a series of videos about some of these key aspects of the design of the New York City subway, including some like other decisions besides why the four tracks include the high speed, you know, it had a minimum design speed of 40 miles an hour, which was very fast. Why did they decide to go underground? Why did they put the platforms so close to the street surface? things like that. So today we're going to talk about the four line, uh, the four track main lines, but there's a paper and you can get a link to the full paper and the link below. And there's other videos on these other aspects of the design. Okay. So the first thing I'll talk about is, uh, why, what other options could, did they consider? Uh, like what were the alternatives? And it's not that difficult to imagine the, they could have had a normal two track system. Like most other metros are still today. This is an illustration from uh, the Budapest Metro, which hadn't been open in 1891, but you know, this would have been a, this is what they could have done. And they, the, the benefit of doing two tracks would be, you could have covered a lot more of the city. It would have been a lot cheaper. So you could have built much more. And two, two track lines are going to have a little bit more capacity than one four track line because with the four track system, the, the express trains are going much faster. They need more separation between each train and you can't actually run the trains as close together 
is at least originally. So you're actually giving up some capacity to have those, those express trains. So it's not about capacity. And the other issue is that if they'd done the two track system it would have been a lot easier to fit, uh, to construct. You can see here that this design, the local tracks at the stations where they, they're coming right up along the lines of the building, the fronts of the building. So they're, they're using all the space that, that exists. It's difficult to fit them in. There were other alternatives proposed too, like this, this the Gribble combination system. And essentially what he was saying was the trains, you could have express trains underground, but they would be coordinated with the streetcars of the surface. So it was, instead of having four tracks, you just would, it would be more coordinated with the streetcars. Or again, you, you can kind of see too here, the benefits of just the two track system. It says vaults area untouched. And what they mean is a lot of the buildings had basements that extended out underneath the sidewalk, they called them vaults for storage, for getting things, you know, loaded, unloaded from the street. And a lot of the property owners were concerned about having those taken away if they had to build a subway. So they're saying they're advertising, look, we wouldn't even have to touch, we wouldn't touch the vaults if we built it this way. And it was a big issue at the time. And then another thing was, is they could have just done three tracks. Like the elevated system had at the time, you've got a southbound track. This is, I think the third Avenue elevated, you've got a southbound track and a, a northbound track. And then you've got a middle track that can go either direction, depending on the peak, which way commuters are going. So they could have done that as well. So why do they do the four track with this local express service, very expensive, complicated system. And like I said, they don't actually say in their original report, they don't say, but in a later report, once they started construction, they refer back to it and they explain. They also point out, quote, in the case of the work now under contemplation, it was recognized at the outset by all without discussion that this railway should represent a step in advance. Consequently, it was determined that over the portion of the route where traffic was heaviest, four tracks should be constructed at once in order to provide for a double express service and that over the balance of the route, two or three tracks should be constructed. But I thought this is interesting because they're saying it was recognized by all without discussion. And that seemed true because I could not find anyone explaining at the time why they did it. But so why did they do it? Speed was a big issue, probably the most, well, they're interrelated, but speed was extremely important. They wanted to achieve a scheduled speed, an average speed of about 30 miles an hour on the overall on the line, uh, which they did with the express trains. But you could not, in order to achieve that, you need express trains that don't stop at every station or the stations are gonna be very far apart, in which case it's not gonna be very convenient. So to get that speed and make it convenient at the same time, do four tracks. You have local tra local trains on the local tracks that make frequent stops and the express trains that go very fast. And you just step across the platform at certain stations to transfer. So the idea was that together you can have both high speed, you know, to get all the way to the terminals relatively quickly. And you can have convenient stations that are, that are about every quarter mile apart. So you can have, and in a way that's also a sort of a time savings because it makes it faster because if the stations take a long time to get to, that adds time to your journey. And you can see, um, I'm not sure how clear it is, but that most of the lines do go three or four tracks all the way to the end, not just in Midtown or Manhattan. So like this is looking at Brooklyn where some of the lines terminate here. This is just two tracks, but this is three, four, three tracks four tracks, three tracks, two just to the very end, but almost three all the way, four tracks to the end. In the Bronx, this one is three tracks, three tracks, three tracks, two tracks, three tracks, and three tracks. So almost all the way to, to most of the terminals or within a few stops of the terminals. And then Queens, three tracks, three tracks, four tracks, two tracks, three tracks, four tracks. Again, almost all the way to the, to the terminals, if not all the way to the end.
And that, again, the point is that the, they wanted this 30 mile an hour average speed to make the city accessible so that people could reach the undeveloped parts of the city within reasonable community distance. And there's going to be a separate video about the speed and why that was so important. But having this, they needed this fast express service. And another reason why they needed to have the stops close together, but they couldn't just have the express trains was to make it, to make it profitable, to make it attractive for someone to build. Intended to have a flat fare, but if the stops are close together, you would attract a lot of local traffic, people who just rode at a few stops. You didn't even take the express service. And if it's the same fare, then you're going to get, you're going to, you'll, you will make more money by having more short distance passengers because they don't ride as far. And that the main driver of the cost of the operating expenses were how many car miles of service you're providing. So having it convenient to local passengers was very important to making the whole thing profitable and to make the project as a whole pay for itself. If you just had the express trains, not only would it be less convenient, but it would it would be less uh, remunerative. And so, so we were talking about speed. It's the first big reason. The other big reason is capacity. The city, this is a chart showing, you know, the population growth. This is the eight largest cities in the world in 1910. And the, these are every 30 years. The last two bars, 1880, 1910, are again around this 1890 period we're talking about. In 1880, and New York was still not as big as Paris, but it would be by 1910, it would be larger. But also, so it's growing fast, but also in New York, many more people use transit, especially rapid transit, something like three times the ridership per capita. For whatever reason, in London, more people walk, or maybe they take the surface, but the 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 metro was was not that was not used nearly as much as the elevator was in New York City. So you have a lot more people commuting in New York. So if you were to look, so the population is dramatic enough. But if you were to look at people riding transit, you'd see that in New York it was far and away the busiest uh, of any of these cities. So they needed the capacity, in other words. And when you look at this system again, this diagram from the 1891 report, you see they do they still have the streetcars there. So it's really in some ways a six track system. So they needed that capacity as well. And that still leaves a question about why not three tracks? Because at this time, there was, as I understand it, not a lot of, I don't think there were that many reverse commuters. The city was relatively monocentric and you didn't need express service in both directions. It doesn't seem obvious to me that you would. And they do, I did find an answer to that. Wouldn't a single, you know, wouldn't having just a peak hour express be sufficient? And they go on to say, heretofore, similar railways have been constructed for a single service with all trains stopping at all stations, with sometimes a limited express or through service on a third track on which trains could run in the direction of heavy of the heaviest travel according to the demands of the hour and stopping at longer intervals than the other trains. It is obvious that this arrangement can furnish express facilities in only one direction at a time, yes? And that the capacity of such a railway is only slightly greater than an ordinary double track road. For the limit of capacity is determined by that of the single track on which the trains from both of the other tracks are returned. So what they're saying is that if you were to just do three tracks, it's not about needing to serve reverse commuters, but rather it's about being able to sustain a service in one direction, a one a sort of a, a service that's concerted in one direction over a long period of time. So if you have three tracks and two tracks are coming in and one is going out, at one end of the line, the terminal is going to be piling up with trains. And at the other terminal, it's going to be running out of trains, right? Because they're sending out to them out on two tracks and they're only getting them back on one track. So their point is essentially they wanted to be able to sustain the service. So you could have either an enormous fleet so that way you can keep an enormous yard so that way you can keep pulling in trains without sending them back and vice versa. But their point was they wanted to be able to sustain this capacity. 
So that's the, that's the reason that that's the what that was what their thinking was why they went right to the the four track system. Then besides speed and capacity, there was a third consideration, not as important, but they imagined uh, a proliferation of branch lines. They saw there being a few main trunk line subways with four tracks and then lots of branch lines connecting parts all over the city. And now that didn't really happen. There are branch lines, but not in the way that they imagined. They did not anticipate the density of traffic. So because the trains are so frequent, it's just not really practical to have the branch lines that they imagined. But that was part of why they wanted to have four tracks on the main line so that you could have lots of branches. So in summary, why the four tracks? Uh, it's really this speed and capacity. And it's kind of a, I think it's a really beautiful design that by having an express service on one set of tracks, a local service on another set of tracks, it really makes it fast because you can, the stations are much closer. Uh, they're not very far apart. So you don't have to take, doesn't take as long to get to a station. And with the express trains, you can get to where you're going much faster. So anyway, I really think it's a beautiful, a beautiful design. Okay. Bye everyone.